Hello, my name is Richard Smith and it's my privilege to share God's word with you this morning. A group of men came to see Jesus. It was a motley crew. Some were extreme religiously orthodox Jews, the Pharisees, but these were accompanied by some of King Herod's aristocrats. They were two factions that were seldom willingly seen together, let alone able to cooperate. In the fevered atmosphere of Passover week, in a Jerusalem thronged with pilgrims from all over the Jewish world, these men set out to trap Jesus. After flattering him as a man of integrity, they said, is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar? Now, this was a really a clever trap, because if Jesus said no, the Roman occupation forces would deal with Jesus for them. If he said yes, many of his Galilean followers would see him as taking the side of the occupying power. They'd get disenchanted and desert him. In a nation that saw itself as God's special people, Jesus was being asked to come out publicly as either a dangerous nationalist or as a collaborator. As followers of Jesus, we too face questions about how we balance living in the eternal kingdom of God with also being citizens of this world and of a particular nation at a particular point in time. Should I pay taxes to a government that spends money on things I don't agree with? Should we vote in elections where no viable party will honour a godly agenda? How may I protest when I disagree with proposed or actual regulations and laws? How should I respond when regulations prevent me from, for a time from meeting fellow Christians for corporate worship? How's that for topical? Should I sing in church when regulations forbid it? How did Jesus respond to his challenges? Well, he asked them to bring him a denarius, a Roman coin quite a high value one actually, and to show it to him. He asked them to tell him whose image and inscription was on the coin. I've no doubt that their reply came through gritted teeth, Caesar's. And Jesus said to them, well then, pay the emperor what belongs to the emperor and pay God what belongs to God. Now there's a clue in Jesus' response as to how we as 21st century Christians can balance our duty to the country we live in today with our duty to that other kingdom, God's kingdom, in which we live both now and for eternity. Liz spoke last week about the saints from Hebrews 11. They died in faith and it says in Hebrews 11 they acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on earth. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Followers of Jesus, like these saints, also have a home country in the eternal kingdom of God. We live in it now, and it remains our country through death and for all eternity. A couple of weeks ago, we remembered all those who died in war and we sang, I vow to thee my country, which is also a bonus song at the end of this service. The second verse of that song reminds us that there is another country and goes on to describe God's kingdom rule of gentleness, of justice and of peace. So first question, how should I live in this world as a citizen of another and greater one. The Jewish exiles in captivity in Babylon in the first half of the sixth century BC faced actually a similar challenge. Their spiritual life had been focused on the Jerusalem temple. And from that, they had been separated when Nebuchadnezzar sacked Jerusalem in 597 BC. How could they honor God while living in a foreign land? They sang in the words of Psalm 137, by the waters of Babylon we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? 
some of you like me are old enough to remember a band called Boney M who turned that into a hit. But because of COVID, of course, you're safe from me trying to sing it to you. But Jeremiah wrote to these exiles, reminding them that the place in which they found themselves was not an accident. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile. The Sovereign Lord had put them there, and they can still live there as his people. He encourages them to get on with life, to maintain the community of God's people, but he also tells them they must be good citizens, contributing to the life of the godless city around them, and that they must pray to the Lord on behalf of Babylon. It says, seek the welfare of the city, for in its welfare, you will find your welfare. God isn't caught by surprise that we are in a secular nation and world. He has placed you and me here as his ambassadors. My current place and time is where I'm called to serve him. God is a God who loves to bless, and our lives in him should bless the people around us and the wider society in which he's placed us. We're called to be exemplary friends, exemplary employees, exemplary suppliers, exemplary neighbours, exemplary citizens. How we live in this world is an expression of our life in the kingdom of God, not the opposite of it. When I pick a herb in our garden, or wild garlic as I walk in the country and I crush the leaves, it leaves a strong scent on my fingers. Wherever my life comes into contact with the world around, there should be that sweet smell of Jesus' presence. Jesus lives in us through the Holy Spirit, so we bring the light and the love of Christ to the corners in which we live, however dark they appear. A long time ago, in the 1950s and 60s, I was taught a hymn that was written even a hundred years earlier than that. Jesus bids us shine with a clear, pure light, like a little candle burning in the night. In this world of darkness, we must shine, you in your small corner and I in mine. And although the words and the sentiments may cloy a little in our 21st century minds, the sentiment there, and of the other verses, which I haven't time for today, captures well the challenge of living for Jesus. Second question, how do I live under a secular government? Well, writing to the Romans, our New Testament reading, the Apostle Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 13. He says that we are to be subject to the governing authorities of the state in which we live. He says that an ordered society is good for us and for the society. It's what the government is for. Peter in his letter says, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. For this is the will of God that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, but not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Paul reminds us that it's not only a matter of pragmatism that we should obey the law, because the authority doesn't bear the sword in vain, is the way he puts it. In other words, there are penalties for breaking the law. I speed and get caught, I get a fine. I fail to pay my taxes, I pay fines or end up in jail. I run a church service during lockdown, as a certain church in Clerkenwell did last weekend, and the police are likely to attend that service, but in their professional capacity. Peter in his first letter talks about suffering because we belong to Jesus, but adds that the warning that we should not suffer, he implies legitimately, as lawbreakers. But Paul says that it's not to do with fear of punishment alone. 
He says that obedience to the authorities is a matter of conscience. We live in a society with rules and laws and ought to support the authorities by obeying them, including the speed limit. I have to be careful here because a preacher in this church once said that if you listen to the minister carefully, you'll find out what his besetting temptations are. Moving on fast. What we see is that for us as Christians, there is a basic principle of obedience to the civic authorities. We're called to live as good, law-abiding citizens. We have a higher loyalty to God, but we accept that he is a Lord of all nations and of all time. He appointed rulers, and mostly we serve him by obeying them. We live in this world as children of God and brothers and sisters of the Prince of Peace. We look to support the authorities, as in obedience to lockdown guidelines, not singing when we're able to meet in church until the regulations change. These regulations are clearly intended for the good of our society, even when we don't like them. But we're also called to pray for our nation. Like the Jewish community exiled in a city that was not their home, we pray to the Lord on its behalf, for its welfare. If you think your government is wrong, pray for it. Writing to Timothy, Paul says this, First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Saviour who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. In other words, good governance is good not only for us and for our society, but the peace that it brings is good for the gospel. It allows the freedom for us to share the good news of Jesus with others. That doesn't mean that we always agree with the positions and the decisions of a particular government. And within the law, Christians may speak out and even protest, seeking to change hearts and minds. Especially, I say again, we can and should pray for our leaders. But there's a question I can't dodge in addressing this. The question is, what if the government acts against Christian faith or asks me to do so? In the later New Testament, particularly under the persecutions that followed, there were situations where the government was acting against Christian faith. Now, this is difficult territory because different Christians are faced with such challenges in very different circumstances. It's not a question to pontificate about as a hypothetical one, but one to explore prayerfully in a particular situation. And it's certainly not one on which we should rush to judge. Remember Jesus' words to his antagonists, pay the emperor what belongs to the emperor and pay God what belongs to God. And Paul's words in Romans 13 still stand. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honour to whom honour is owed. Some principles I think I see in scripture when dealing with a government that is explicitly acting against Christian faith. I can include four one is obedience to God's clear word, our obedience. Second, respect for the authorities he has appointed or permitted. Third, accepting that disobedience to authorities has consequences in this world. And fourth, showing the grace as well as the truth that is in Jesus Christ. Now there's no time to explore these properly here, but. Let me just say a few words about each. Obedience to God's clear word. I may have all sorts of political or social views and opinions. 
that's legitimate and it's human. But I must be careful not to try to recruit God to my, si my side or my cause. It should be the other way around. It is possible that there is a difference between my personal convictions and what God's word actually says. If I find myself in open opposition to civil government, it must only ever, ever be on the grounds of genuine obedience to God's word. And to ensure that, I must prayerfully and humbly seek his guidance. I must study his word and I must submit my individual, personal opinions to the prayerful reflections of a wide range of Christian brothers and sisters, just to make sure I'm not going off on one. For example, contrast that individual stance of the pastor of the Angel Church in Clerkenwell with the way many national Christian leaders are at this time working together, engaging with government and influencing the COVID regulations under which we as churches operate. In Acts chapter 4, Peter and John were arrested and jailed for speaking for Christ. They were arrested for acting in obedience to Jesus' clear, direct command, not for matters of personal opinion. Second condition for dealing with a government that's acting against Christian faith is respect for the authorities that God has appointed. In the Romans passage that Pam read to us, Paul says that Rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. My first instinct should always be to assume that this is true in my situation. However, even if the governance under which I live is so corrupt that it terrorises good conduct and encourages bad, I should still seek to support and respect the areas in which the authorities are still behaving rightly slowing the rot like salt in bad meat. Civil disobedience of any sort is a last resort, not a first. Peter and John showed respect to the council, the civil authorities in Jerusalem. When they were called before it the next morning, they'd been arrested, they had their hearing, and only when the council said they must not speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus, did they say to the council members, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. Said with respect. Third, accepting that disobedience to authorities has consequences in this world. Like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter and John didn't seek to fight or to evade arrest, trusting the outcome to God's good and merciful plan. Their friends prayed for them. In one of his lesser known speeches, Dr. Martin Luther King spoke of the conditions in which Christian people might act in civil disobedience, fighting for the civil rights of black people in the USA. He made it clear to his followers that they must be prepared to face the consequence, even of peaceful acts of civil disobedience, and that those consequences might include jail. And my fourth condition is that we show the grace as well as the truth of Jesus Christ. I was greatly struck in my late teens by an interview with the World War II Bishop of Singapore, John Leonard Wilson. He was interned by the Japanese in Changi Prison where he was severely tortured. Many years later, he met one of his torturers who had seen Leonard's grace and respect even for those harming him. That torturer turned to Christ because of the light he saw in the life of this godly man. Paul was on his way as a prisoner to Rome, where it appears he was ultimately executed. There was a shipwreck. He had given prophetic warning of this, but still showed care for the ship's crew and for his guards, saving them from death by his God-given instructions. Jesus prayed for his executioners. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. While it's possible for Christians to be in a position where we disobey evil laws, where even faith itself becomes a crime, we are still called upon to show the character of Jesus with the strength that he will provide in that hour. So finally, how do I live in two kingdoms? 
The answer is to follow faithfully in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. We obey him and, as he said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We live not in opposition to our citizenship in this world, rather we use that citizenship as an opportunity to live out the values and the priorities of God's kingdom, the values of that other country whose ways are ways of gentleness and all her paths are peace. We live, as Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, we live distinctively, like salt in food, preserving our society, helping prevent its decay and giving it a taste of God's goodness. We live brilliantly as the light of the world, a reflection of Jesus, set on a lampstand, shining light and truth into dark corners. And we live conspicuously, like a city set on a hill, Jesus said, so that in God's church, amongst God's people, all may see, however imperfectly, the new society that God is building among his people. A society that will one day be made perfect in heaven, conspicuously, so that people see and long to be part of God's kingdom. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we seek to serve you in this world in which you've placed us, in this time and place, we ask that by your Holy Spirit you fill us and equip us for that service day by day that we may bring glory to Jesus living distinctively living brilliantly living conspicuously for him amen may god bless you as you seek to live for jesus christ this week <laughs>